it's really an honor to be invited to, to speak here today. And I think I speak for all of the professionals when we say it's very important for us to come to these parent meetings because the questions you ask us and the concerns that you raise for us really drive our research and they tell us what we need to study. So thank you. I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, moving forward from uh, Anne's presentation and talk about uh, the work that I've been involved in uh, with children and teenagers with 22Q and talk about the relationship between their cognitive profiles and how that affects their school. So how do we assess the brain and behavior? Well, we can look at the structure of the brain and we do that with CT scans and MRI scans. Many of your children have had those. Um, we can look at how the brain is functioning, the chemical and electrical activity of the brain using EEG studies and PET scans. But really, the only way we can tell how that brain is functioning in the real world, um, what that brain is doing, is to do neuropsychological evaluations. So here, we see um, changes in the brain over time, in the structure of the brain. And really, by age <coughs> seven, most children's brains are about 95% of what they're going to look like. The structure of the brain is 95% complete. And you can see these dramatic changes that occur over time, where the brain is folding in over itself. Gray matter, which are the cells <coughs> where thinking occurs, uh, starts to disappear, and white matter pathways start to take over. White matter pathways are how parts of the brain communicate uh, to each other. And here we can see how um, we can study electrical stimulation of the brain. Here is somebody just looking at a checkerboard pattern. And you can see this is the hot area of the brain. It's the visual spatial system responding to just looking at a checkerboard. And the front of the brain is kind of cold. There's not much going on because it's not being used. And here you can see these little dots here. Um, that's where I spilled coffee on it. <laughs> so, so you've seen how we can look at the structure of the brain and the physiology of the brain. But it's really only by doing this very extensive testing that we find out how that person is functioning in their world. So when a child comes to me, they go through about seven hours of testing. I do it over two days. I don't want to stress out the children. And it's a lot of fun. They win all kinds of prizes. Um, in the United States, when children are evaluated through the school district, they their intelligence is measured, their academic skills, and then some rating scales of mood and behavior. So we do all that also so that we can help out in school, but then we look much more carefully at finer structures, at finer behaviors. So abstract reasoning skills, how well can these children reason, um, their attention and concentration skills, their attention for short periods of time, their ability to shift attention as needed, their ability to pay attention for long periods of time, um, their executive functions, so higher level thinking skills, planning, organization, and goal setting, and working memory, which I'm particularly interested in. Uh, working memory is <clears throat> your ability to hold and use information in your head. So if somebody gives you a telephone number, and you dial that number, but if I asked you for that telephone number a minute later, you wouldn't know it. But you held it in working memory long enough that to use it uh, when you needed it. And now it turns out we can actually fix uh, or expand working memory. Uh, I look at longer term memory, children's ability to learn in verbal and visual spatial modalities, um, expressive and receptive language skills. I do, uh, you know, not nearly the kind of evaluation that Cindy Solot or a speech language uh, pathologist would do, but enough to know basically if there are receptive or expressive problems. And then of course visual, perceptual and visual motor integration skills and fine motor speed and dexterity skills. All of our children with 22Q have, are born with low tones, so they have fine motor problems. Um, I'm just showing this because it's the most common IQ test battery actually used around the world. Uh, and from that, we look at uh, verbal intellectual abilities, children's abilities to define words, to uh, use language for abstract reasoning, um, Nonverbal intellectual abilities, so your ability to solve puzzles and matrices not using language, and you get an overall full-scale score. That's your grand IQ score. Um, and these are the different ages, uh, preschoolers, school-age children, uh, and teenagers and young adults. And now uh, the newer batteries are broken down a little bit more. So in our early studies, 
uh, we found that um, the, the mean IQ score for about 200 children that we saw with 22Q was in what's called the borderline range. So about one and a half standard deviations below average. And what that immediately tells us is that children will learn slowly. If you have a borderline IQ, you still learn. You just need more repetition. You need more individual contact. But the big surprise, especially for me, expecting to see children who are born with such early language delays, um, I was expecting that their verbal IQ scores would be much lower than their nonverbal IQ scores. But much to my surprise, just in the first 10 children that I saw back in 1992, um, the verbal IQ scores were much higher in seven out of 10. And then every time we looked at this again and again, with 100 children, 200 children, 70% of them actually have higher verbal and nonverbal IQ scores. And so this, the um, full scale IQ score is really a meaningless uh, composite of these very different scores. And when the verbal IQ score is higher, it's higher by a lot. This is nearly a full standard deviation. So, um, and the range was very big. So 70% of the children had uh, verbal IQ scores that were at least 10 points higher. Um, and in the few cases where performance was higher, it was only a little bit higher. And this is the same example that Donna showed. Um, my viewers picked the biggest example. Um, this is a child where he had um, a 46-point difference between his verbal and nonverbal intellectual abilities. And if I tested any one of you, everyone's a little bit better at some thing than others, but <clears throat> typically only about six or eight points. So um, a difference of 46 points is quite, mean it's quite meaningful. Uh, and so this overall IQ score really doesn't mean anything. Um, and more extensive testing in our neuropsychological battery, these are z-scores. So the bigger the bar, the worse it is. Much to our surprise, we found that verbal learning, so if you simply repeat information over and over again, children learn it, <clears throat> children with 22Q learn it at the same level as children without um, 22Q. So that's clearly what they're taking advantage of to learn in school. Um, whereas if you ask them, so it's actually much stronger than their verbal IQ scores. If you try to teach them things using stories, that's much harder. Again, because of the language problems and visual learning skills are quite weak. So the same pattern that we saw on IQ testing, we see in the memory testing. And then looking at academic skills, here's math, very weak compared to any reading skill. And verbal reading comprehension was particularly weak. And again, it's because Children with borderline IQs have difficulty inferencing from reading. So unless something is explicitly told to them, they have difficulty <laughs> figuring it out for themselves while they're reading. So um, this concept of a nonverbal learning disability uh, occurred, uh, was developed by Byron Rourke in the 1980s. And basically, Children with nonverbal learning disabilities have higher verbal IQ scores, like children with 22Q. Their reading skills are stronger than their math skills. They have poor fine motor skills. Um, they have difficulty with social skills. Um, and they're very prone to anxiety and depression. And I thought this model, um, it, it's just a model, but it's a way for pulling together all this information that we were finding about children with 22Q. And Byron work describes assets, so strengths, children with 22Q and deficits, so weaknesses. The strengths are higher verbal IQ scores, strong rote verbal learning skills, good word reading skills and phonetic decoding skills, um, good immediate auditory attention skills, and good simple focused attention. The problems children with 22Q and children with nonverbal learning disabilities run into is um, difficulties with visual perception and visual motor integration skills, so putting together block designs, drawing, um, difficulties in mathematics and difficulties with complex verbal memory skills like stories um, and lots of fine and, gro and gross motor difficulties as well as weak visual memory. Um, there are a number of emotional and behavioral disorders that have also been associated with nonverbal learning disorders such as attention disorders, again weak social skills, poor adaptability, uh, adaptability to change so it's so children have to really be prepared for changes. They don't adapt very well. 
Um, and again, uh, high levels of internalizing disorders such as depression and anxiety. And our most current research shows that about 63% of children with 22Q will eventually develop an anxiety disorder. Um, <clears throat> also in children with nonverbal learning disorders, we see deficits in the nonverbal aspects of communication, the subtleties of language. So difficulties understanding someone else's point of view and sharing, uh, difficulties interpreting facial expressions or body language. So if someone's saying to you, yeah, yeah, and you know that they're really not very interested, but someone with 22Q or a nonverbal learning disability won't be able to interpret that. Um, there, it's, uh, no model is perfect, <clears throat> and I think the strengths of this model um, as it applies to 22Q is that it does seem to map onto 22Q very well. Um, and several centers uh, around the United States and Europe have, uh, have found uh, similar things in studies of large samples of children with 22Q. And it really, for me, it just provides a data organizing framework. Um, and at least in the United States, um, this model is known to educators. So if you say this child has a nonverbal learning disability, it'll give them a sense of the kinds of uh, strengths and weaknesses that the child is likely to show. The problems are, um, in the United States, it's not officially recognized as a special education classification, so when I classify children, I have to classify them as something else. Um, it also, as uh, Cindy mentioned, it minimizes, uh, or the risk is that it minimizes the impact of the very significant and long-standing uh, language difficulties that children with 22Q will have. And it also doesn't really address uh, the executive deficits. So the higher level thinking, planning, organizational, and working memory problems that children with 22Q almost universally will display. So what do we do? Well, um, I think as Anne pointed out, you really need a team approach uh, at the school level. And I'm sorry that I don't know in each country how the teams work, but I'm sure that um, I know that they exist in every country. So they need help from special education teachers, for specific classroom modifications, to teach organizational skills, to pay more attention to reading comprehension. Uh, they need uh, ongoing work with speech language pathologists and occupational therapists. Uh, pediatric neuropsychologists, I think, are uh, this kind of evaluation is really critical for children with 22Q because it really expands the kinds of evaluations, limited evaluations, that are available in most schools. So the more data that you have, the more specific and targeted your interventions can be. Um, cognitive behavior therapists are very helpful in reducing anxiety, teaching techniques to help focus in class, working on social skills with children. Um, developmental behavioral pediatricians or child psychiatrists are necessary to help manage the complex healthcare needs. You basically need a captain who's gonna say, okay, now it's time to do this, now it's time to do that. Many of the children I see, their, their pediatricians at home want to help, but they really just don't know how to address the complex needs of the children. So developmental pediatricians and child psychiatrists are specifically have that extra training to do that. So when should you do a neuropsychological evaluation? I like to say it doesn't depend on the age, it depends on key transition points when big changes are happening in life. So preschool and kindergarten, we need to do these kinds of assessments to prepare children for academic learning in school. In the United States, in third grade, there's a big uh, shift that occurs, and teachers like to say that children stop uh, learning to read and they start reading to learn, so they're expected to do much more independent learning. And that's a big shift, and a lot of students start failing at that level. Um, so they're increasingly functionally independent. In middle school, they suddenly go from having one teacher who's like the shepherd of their flock. My wife is a first grade teacher, so she takes responsibility for all of her students. But in middle school, suddenly you have seven or eight teachers, and you have to adapt every 45 minutes, and that's a big challenge. Um, so they transition from classroom teachers to subject teachers. Uh, before high school. In high school, uh, multitasking increases. Children have short-term projects, long-term projects, more teachers. The needs for functional independence go up even higher. And then um, evaluations before college are really critical. Colleges in the United States won't give you uh, help unless they have data that you really need that help. 
And the nice thing about seeing uh, kids with 22Q in their families for now more than two decades uh, is that more and more of uh, the children I've seen are going to college. So they're coming back to me and I'm doing pre-college evaluations and that's really very rewarding. And in the United States, there are more and more colleges that are adapting their curriculum and have special programs just for children uh, with developmental disabilities. So it's a great thing. That's, that's really only in the past two decades or so that these problems, that these programs rather, um, have come about. Uh, a few academic interventions that I've gotten uh, good feedback from parents about are uh, touch map. <coughs> it's, uh, for some reason, kids with 22Q seem to do very well with it. It's a hands-on, uh, manipulative, multi-sensory approach to teaching mathematics. Alpha smart keyboards, faster than writing. As soon as you can, transition uh, your children to keyboard. Um, there's also uh, Joan Green, is a uh, speech and language pathologist in Washington, and she has a new book. Um, I don't know if you can read this, it's innovativespeech.com. She's terrific. She reviews every iPad app uh, and breaks them down by what kind of intervention they're useful for. Very, very helpful. Um, and in terms of reading, Research has shown that it doesn't really matter which reading program you use, as long as it's an evidence-based program. It's the consistency and intensity. So the more you do it, and, and the, the more you stick to the way it was uh, developed, the more likely you are to, make, to uh, have success. After high school, again, there are an increasing number of supported college programs I'm happy to see. In the United States, uh, you have something called an individualized education program when, you in, when you're in school. And if you have that, when you graduate, you automatically transition into a vocational program. Um, so that's very helpful in the United States if you don't want to go to college or if you want to take a break before college. And then there are a number of uh, independent living situations. Um, my partner in my practice is actually on a board where they have several homes uh, and a whole series of apartments for young adults with intellectual disabilities, and all of them work, and they have roommates, they have to learn how to cook, they have a social calendar of like bowling night and movie night, it's really terrific. Um, that's all I wanted to say. <laughs>